Good morning. Welcome to worship this beautiful sp spring morning. I guess we can say it's spring now. Uh, welcome to worship at New Town United Methodist Church on this spring Sunday. If you're in our parking lot right now listening, please honk your horn. And if you're not listening, I guess we won't, <laughs> won't hear your horn. Okay, I do want to thank everybody who tunes in on uh, Facebook Live and those who will be watching this after the fact. It means a great deal to us to be able to, uh, to share the love of Christ with everybody. So again, we thank you for being a part of our worship today. If you are in the parking lot for the drive-in service, I do want to remind you, uh, thank you so much for the little pantry donations that you submit, you, uh, you bring for our little pantry. Uh, we couldn't do it without a faithful core of volunteers that, that replenish the little pantry uh, almost on a daily basis. And for the many of you that bring in uh, fresh food and other supplies to help our people in the neighborhood. So thank you for that. I also want to mention that um, thank you for your faithful giving uh, to your regular offerings. Our offering last week was $2,801, and to date, our uh, year-to-date average offering is $2,556, which is above what we need, which is great. I do want to mention, because of your faithful giving, we've been able to pay our entire apportionments to the conference for missions throughout Ohio and the world. Uh, we paid that in full uh, this year, and we've also been able to send uh, generous gifts to uh, IPM and also to uh, Lindsay Hines and the uh, University of Cincinnati campus ministry. And that comes out of the church funds that you have given to us. So thank you for your generous giving, and we will try to continue to make decisions for missions beyond the local church and encourage you to give faithfully whatever way you can to those causes. I also want to mention that um, next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and I could hand out palm branches and have everybody just circle your cars in a parade back there. I don't think we're going to do that, though. But next Sunday is Palm Sunday, which means that next week is Holy Week. I did want to mention that we are going to have a special drive-in service on Good Friday, Good Friday, uh, April 2nd, at 12 o'clock noon. We will have worship just as we're having it today. If you watch on Facebook Live, you'd like to tune in at noon on Friday uh, next week. I mean, a week from Friday, a week from Friday, <laughs> the Holy Week, uh, you may join us for Good Friday worship then. And then Easter Sunday will be a communion Sunday, and we'll have communion on Easter Sunday for that special day. So again, Good Friday, April 2nd, we'll have uh, drive-in worship and Facebook Live at 12 noon and uh, Sundays as usual. I just have one prayer uh, announcement to make, one concern. Uh, prayers of sympathy and support continue to go out to the family and friends of Richard Zog. Uh, Richard is the father of Steve, and uh, Richard died on Saturday, March 13th, and a funeral uh, was held this past Friday in Coshocton uh, for Richard Zog. So please uh, keep the Zog family in your prayers, and. Uh, the, the loss of a father is, and a grandfather is a very, a very important thing. So we want to uh, continue to keep the Zog family in our prayers. Well, that's it for me right now. So let's begin our worship by joining together and singing our opening hymn, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross.
join me in the call to worship. God calls us to new and everlasting life. We long for life that is full and stable. To receive this new life, we must let go of the old one. It is scary to let go of what we know. The God of eternal love invites us to this task. We will trust in our God and let go so that we might receive. Please join me in our prayer of confession. O oh God of forgiveness, we pray for new life as we confess our old ways. We hear of your promise amid our own sense of self-doubt. Hope is proclaimed, yet we seek guarantees. Christ calls us to obedience, but we set conditions. When called on to follow, we ask to what end? We applaud commitment, but we treasure our comfort. Forgive our reluctance to walk in newness of life. Although he was, as we are, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Today, as we come before God confessing our sins, Jesus, the high priest, is our source of forgiveness. Trust in the word of Christ and be forgiven. Our Psalter reading this morning is from Psalm 51, chapters 1 through 12. Please read, please read responsibly. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was born into iniquity, and I have been sinful since my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth, in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be made clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. A new covenant. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we pray for you to create a, a clean heart in us. We pray for that new beginning which is ours every morning. We pray for your love to be at the heart of this worship. We pray for you to hear our music and our prayers and our preaching as a demonstration of our faith in you and guide the words of this message that it might be truthful to your good news of, to us through Jesus Christ our Lord, and encourage us all in our faith today. In God's name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't usually rant that much. I'm not prone to get that angry. In fact, I'm, I get angry so rarely that I guarantee when I get angry in front of our two sons, they would get really worried. Uh, because that's not my nature, but I kind of want to rant a little bit, if you'll let me. I'm, I'm just kind of tired of this pandemic. I'm going COVID crazy. I can't stand this thing. I don't want to see that stupid cartoon picture of the COVID virus ever again. I'm hoping and praying for the day when the news doesn't open with something about COVID or something about vaccination schedules or, or walk, looking at a county map to see if the colors are changing. I am so tired of being apart from other people. I am zoomed out. I am fatigued. I am, I am aggrieved at the number of people who have died from COVID. This past Sunday, uh, the uh, Ohio River Valley District had a memorial service for those who have died in our district. And there were dozens of names dozens of members of our district churches who have passed because of this terrible disease. I'm so tired of this. I want you to understand that we want to get back to worship as soon as we can, but we also want to get back to worship safely together. And so, you know, I'm sure you always hate to hear me say this, but we're going to continue doing worship as we are doing it. Uh, I've been in conversation with some of our church leaders and we want to get the place ready and we want to get the church ready and prepared for this before we begin worship again so that when we begin worship again, we're all our ducks in a row and we are going to do it safely and well. So please be patient with me. I know you're tired of watching me on a screen. I'm tired of talking to empty pews. I'm so happy for people in the parking lot. Could you honk your horn one more time? All right, I'm so, I like those horns and I encourage you to consider Consider, if you would, uh, driving over to the church on Easter morning. Enjoy. It would be great to have many more cars in the parking lot on Easter Sunday. And if you've never been here, there is a palpable difference sitting in your car listening to this thing. I, I can't explain it to you, but there is. 
And uh, so consider that, or any Sunday. But I think one of the things that, that gets me down is that when we are at, apart from each other, we move away from our hearts and spend most of our time in our heads. We move away from our hearts and spend most of our time in our heads. And anytime there's a debate or discussion, the heart generally doesn't come up. People start throwing out facts or random facts or perceptions, and before too long, we are at an impasse because, you see, our heads keep us apart and our hearts bring us together. Faith is a heart. Oh, excuse me, this happens, technical problems. All right, we're back on. Now, if you get, excuse my hand, I'll get the, there we go. You know, back in the day with, when TV was, was at its infancy, they would have a, show a picture of a guy with his back to you working at trying to repair your TV set. And it says, please be with us, be patient with us, some technical difficulties. Well, we had technical difficulties there, hopefully, uh, when we put it together, when Christy puts it together for YouTube, we can cut that out. But anyway, as I was saying, technical difficulties aside, it's faith is a heart matter. Faith is a heart matter. So I want to spend some time thinking about how you and I can get out of our heads and make faith a heart matter again. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to explain there, there are different levels of faith development. Uh, you can see books with like seven or nine different stages of faith development. I'd like to break it down into three. Three kinds of faith. The first, and the first three are all heart matters. The first kind of faith is a childlike faith. This is a faith you have in your little kid. This is a faith where you where say, now I lay me down to sleep. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for a wonderful day. Jesus is a good shepherd taking care of you. God is love. And you don't know anything else. That is just fine. God is love. We, we talk about Jesus coming as a little baby uh, in the nativity. And we give thanks to baby Jesus. We give thanks to God. God is good all the time. God is love. And if you're lucky, if you come to a loving church, you look forward to coming to church, either with some family members or with friends. The next, next stage of faith I like to call adolescence faith or, or youthful faith. And that's the time in your life where you're really, you're really beginning to think about things. You're, you're going through junior high and high school, beginning to identify who you are and start dreaming about plans for your future. Might include college, might include uh, some vocation, it might include some traveling, but you, you begin to, to care about the world. You, you care about social concerns. You care about injustice. You care about peace. You care about um, identity. And you're willing to, uh, to identify with, with other people and, and seek people who will encourage you. And you are optimistic about the future because you've got your whole life ahead of you and you've got a strong and stirring faith. You believe in your heart of hearts that faith does change things. The third level of faith is what I would call Christ-like faith, and this is kind of hard to, to reach, but most people reach it eventually, some earlier than others. This is where you begin to understand that your faith is to be given away, that your life is not for yourself, but your life is for others. A Christ-like faith is willing to, to change your schedule around to do a good turn for someone else. Actually, the Boy Scouts have always been to, you know, do a good turn daily, do a good deed daily. Boy Scouts learn this early, and that's part of what it means to be a scout. But it's part of what it means to be a Christian. And when you, when you conceive of, of Christ-like faith, you begin to say not only the things that you can do for others, but the things that others have done for you. That's a wonderful way to live. Okay, childlike faith, youth faith, adult faith, Christ-like faith. The thing is, once you get to Christ-like faith, you see, it's very easy to get off of that. It's very easy to get off of that because that's kind of a, you know, that's a hard road to hoe, as, as they used to say. It's tough to be like Christ. It can come, go to your head. Uh, you might feel humbled and feel like you're just not up to it, or you just might feel sad or discouraged. And the minute discouragement comes in, the minute doubt comes in, the minute you move from your heart to your head, things start breaking down. 
So we, we, we retreat to those levels of faith that used to help us, and we go back to childlike faith, but because it's with our head and not our heart, rather than saying God is love, we, be, we start saying, well, this is, this is good and that is bad. Light shines here, darkness shines there. We begin to be judgmental of people that aren't with us. When it gets to the uh, adolescence level and we start thinking about causes, then it gets really ugly. We can become self-righteous. We can b believe that we are so much on the right side of things that we diminish and demean the people on the other side. You know what I'm talking about. This happens every day. And so losing our hearts, we can't even get those, uh, those lower levels working very well. And it's kind of, a, kind of a scary place to be. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. We can always get back in touch with God. We can always open our hearts again to Christ. John Wesley believed in the reality of what he called backsliding. John Wesley believed that it was very easy for Christians to lose the mark, and to get discouraged, and to move from their hearts back to their heads. So Wesley, he used practical theology. He helped try to, again, engage the head to think about it, but then move it again to the heart. But what, what I, when I read my scriptures, I say when we get to God's really heavy heart work, God comes to us at our very worst, and God saves us. God comes to us at our very worst, and there's a shock to the system, and then God kind of digs in and helps pull us out of the muck and the mire and lead us into new life again. So what could be worse than COVID? Very few things. We've had other tragedies, other things. We've had warfare and other great tragedies, but this is pretty bad. So let's compare it to uh, the two passages today. The first one is, is Psalm 51, and it's a Psalm of David. And this is a Psalm that David says at, when he's at his very worst. How bad is it? Well, it's so bad that the preamble uh, in the New Revised Standard Version says, this is a Psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. This is a psalm that David prayed after the prophet Nathan revealed to him, accused him of adultery with Bathsheba, causing her husband Uriah to die on the battlefield and his betrayal of his wife. And of course, the birth of a child through Bathsheba. David was at his low point in his entire life. Things couldn't get any worse for him. Nathan was a respected prophet, and David was ashamed. But David was a man after God's own heart. So he pleads to God in this psalm. You heard most of it this morning. But it reaches this crescendo where he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And God gives David that new heart. Now, God doesn't clean things up for David. If you follow the, the story of David, um, he has many struggles after this, this act of sin. But one struggle he does not have is knowing the love of God. God comes to David at his lowest point and says, I love you, I will save you, I will renew you, I will be with you. You may fail me, but I will never fail you. And from that, you see, it becomes a foundation from which we can always push up we can push up and we can become strong and move forward. Created me a new heart, oh God. God gives David a heart transplant. Now, when we turn to the prophet Jeremiah, things are bad once again. How bad are they? Well, they're about as bad as you can imagine. Jeremiah was a prophet in Judah and uh, King Jos Josiah was a very good king and a king of reform a king that basically brought a, an errant people back to God. He, he, got, he cleaned up the temple and got things all lined up, got their faithful worship of God back in order. But then King Josiah died, and after that, things fell apart again. Things got so bad with the prophet, we call Jeremiah the weeping prophet because he was with Judah when they were invaded by Babylon, saw uh, leaders taken into captivity, chained up and carted away to Babylon, and saw the temple destroyed. All this happened in front of Jeremiah's eyes. And they needed, they needed some hope. And hope comes through the prophet. 
Jeremiah gets the word of God and God says to him, the days are surely coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant where, again, the people tried to follow and they failed. No, the Lord says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, keeping in your head or say to one another, know the Lord, again, in your head, but they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. I will put my love into their hearts. I'll be at work in their hearts. So says the Lord. God gives us a heart transplant. Well, that's all in the Old Testament and that's all well and good, but where does Jesus come in? Well, Jesus comes in in a very, very amazing way. Through Christ, God shows us God's love in an irrevocable fashion. And again, when Jesus came to save us, when Jesus lived his life, he came at another low point. The Jews were under Roman captivity, and it was very hard to worship God. And, and many, many doubts would assail them, and Jesus nevertheless taught and, and showed them the love of God. Before his trouble, he was put to death on a cross by Rome. So they thought they'd get rid of this troublemaker for, for good. And uh, decades after the death of Christ, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, destroyed for the last time. Again, raised to the ground. And the words we read in the letters of Paul were written after the dis destruction of the temple, where it would seem like all hope was gone. And yet you see, God comes to us at the lowest point to say, I have never forgiven you or forsaken you. So that Paul can write in the book, and in the book of Romans, Chapter 8, Paul can write these memorable words. What will separate us from the love of God, the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Love is God's own doing, and for that, you see, Paul would sacrifice his life, and Paul would show us that our lives are a gift to give to others. That's what we need to know right now. That's what you need to know right now, and I want to add, you need to know, you need to know that the heart of Christ is at work in this church. I feel it. I know it. My wife knows it. You know it. The heart of Christ is alive in this church. There's no reason for us to feel despondent. And if we feel down, then we need to walk with one another, not argue with one another, but join hands and hearts together. Join hands and hearts together in whatever way we can, through phone calls, through Zoom meetings, through those tentative, uh, to th through those uh, steps to the vaccinations. When we get vaccinated, we're basically saying, we are doing this so that we might be able to touch others with the love of Christ. Christ's love is that great. We all could use a heart transplant right now. So I encourage you, I encourage you to turn to Christ and know that throughout the scriptures, God is aware of our suffering, God's aware of our mistakes, God, God's aware of our doubts, God's aware of our backsliding, God's aware of our fears, but God gives us love and hope and faith and blessing and riches and grace. This is all a gift of God to us. So hang in there, hang in there, but let's not, let's not be isolated from one another. Let's choose love. Let's choose a heart life. Let's choose a life that opens up our church with other churches, other people of faith. And then together we might proclaim in the world God's love is greater than whatever can be separating us. God's love is that good. Let us pray. Dear Lord our God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for all those, all those people of faith that have been a part of our lives, not only in their witness to you and the acts of love that they've, they've shared, but also in the ways in which they've made a way for us. You remind us that we all struggle. 
you know of our hesitation, but you also know of our capacity for good. You know of the ways in which we've been able to turn to you and we've, we've felt your love. You've felt the ways when we've reached out beyond ourselves and felt the, the joy which comes through service. We pray not only for this little church, but for all the churches that are represented through our listening audience, those people that will, will turn to, to Facebook Live or YouTube and, and hear these words. I pray for every church because every church needs a new heart, including this one. But we thank you again for opening up our eyes to your world where all people are people of value. Everyone is a child of God. It cut, it cut me off again. They're still here. Well, there we go. Cut off again. So, anyway, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. I'm, I'm, holding, I'm doing a selfie now. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer together. And I apologize for all the technical glitches today. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let me say the benediction today. May the God of peace make you holy through and through. May you be kept sound in spirit, mind, and body, blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is utterly faithful, and he will finish what he has set out to do. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. Have a blessed week.